And I will now switch to edge revelation and very closely related to heart failure and how early edge revelation detection can improve outcomes. So we all know that atrial fibrillation is a disease of the elderly individual and that there is a delay in atrial fibrillation onset in women about 10 years. But if you get only old enough, similar to heart failure, women and men will develop atrial fibrillation one out of three individuals. As I said, and more data will be presented to you on one of the late breakers, that um, atrial fibrillation onset in women is later, here 71 years on, in the median, compared to 67 years in men. Again, one of the strongest risk factors of atrial fibrillation is hypertension. Here you see two peaks, individuals with a, developing atrial fibrillation and without, and those developing atrial fibrillation have a significantly higher baseline blood pressure across European cohorts. Also, the population attributable fraction is significant, and it's one of the highest population attributable risk fractions for classical risk factors. And we all know that hypertension is related to stroke, similar to other risk factors, and the pathways for cardioembolic stroke are complex, but we think that they go through cardiovascular dysfunction, lifetime impact of cardiovascular risk factors, atrial cardiomyopathy, and then atrial fibrillation is a good marker, possibly also a causal factor for cardioembolic stroke in individuals with hypertension, obesity, and other cardiovascular risk factors. How do we see atrial fibrillation? We, the classical way is clinically detected atrial fibrillation, like symptomatic patients, post-stroke, post-surgery or other uh, diseases as secondary or triggered atrial fibrillation, but increasingly we are able to detect atrial fibrillation early. This can be by implanted cardiac devices, this can be by intensified screening, but this can also be by consumers, by people starting to screen themselves for atrial fibrillation. This also provides some opportunities if we detect atrial fibrillation early, we cannot only prevent stroke, but we can possibly also prevent the substrate and modify the substrate. This is why I talked about atrial cardiomyopathy, and we can manage risk factors and comorbidities. We can perform um, rhythm control and anticoagulation, and thus maybe reduce the progression of the disease. And this means, shown in this slide, that the risk-benefit ratio of oral anticoagulation for stroke in the beginning for early atrial fibrillation is probably not very high. But when we detect atrial fibrillation early, we have the ability to prevent progression and we are often better at rhythm control. The complex mechanisms behind that include calcium handling, abnormalities, ion channel dysfunction, autonomic neural control and structural remodeling, if addressed early, we can reduce this, um, these triggers of focal ectopic firing and reduce the re-entry prone substrate. We all know that the natural history of atrial fibrillation is paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, two more persistent types of atrial fibrillation uh, depending on the individuum, and we have a progression rate here on average of 7% per year, clinically detected atrial fibrillation. We also have device-detected atrial fibrillation, increasing numbers we see here. And here we also have the opportunity even earlier, this is subclinical atrial fibrillation often, to modify the atrial substrate, in particular through management of risk factors and cardiovascular comorbidities. And what is here again, the number is similar, 7 to 9% of device-detected atrial fibrillation convert into clinically detected atrial fibrillation per patient year. In very eyes, we have highest stroke rates in individuals with persistent and permanent atrial fibrillation. This is much lower in paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. And here you see um, in device-detected atrial fibrillation very low stroke rates, about 1% per year. But still, two large trials, the Artesia study 
and the NOAA AFNET 6 study addressed this issue. And in the large Artesia trial on the left hand side, you see that a Pixar barn treatment of early um, atrial fibrillation device detected atrial fibrillation had a significant benefit for stroke outcomes. The NOAA AFNET 6 smaller study was um, terminated early due to fertility, but you can see that the curves appear to be similar. So with early detection of atrial fibrillation, be it through medical and the medical system, be it through atrial fibrillation screening efforts or through consumer detected atrial fibrillation, gives us the opportunity to check for comorbidities and manage lifestyle and risk factors. And with that, this is a recent expert statement from the AF Screen International Collaboration. We have the opportunity to probably reduce progression of cardiomyopathy and thus reduce or slow the progression of atrial fibrillation towards more persistent types of atrial fibrillation. And importantly, very likely, we are still lacking the outcome data, but very likely significant endpoints, not only stroke, but also increasingly important dementia, cognitive impairment, anxiety, quality of life, and in particular, heart failure. Heart failure is the most common cause of death in patients with atrial fibrillation, not stroke. Also, we can reduce hospitalization, and therefore we think that early detection and treatment of atrial fibrillation may be cost effective. How do we detect atrial fibrillation? It is the classical pathways through, for example, um, monitor, um, blood pressure monitoring, where the system tells you there is a possible arrhythmia, and modern devices, uh, with modern devices you can take an ECG and then have the diagnosis immediately at hand or you can use handheld devices, or you can use consumer-initiated um, devices, um, apps, or um, wristbands, or smart watches, or the classical way of holter monitoring up to patches and implantable loop recorders. That means many ways of detecting atrial fibrillation, and this is why we increasingly see atrial fibrillation and increasingly see atrial fibrillation early. Whenever we diagnose atrial fibrillation, we should think and manage this patient and individual along the multidisciplinary approach to atrial fibrillation management. And what you can see here from last year's guidelines, atrial fibrillation management guidelines, in the first place is the C in the AF care pathway. C for comorbidities and risk factor management. And at any stage that you identify atrial fibrillation, this is the most important task for you. And then comes A for avoid stroke and thromboembolism, R for reduce rhythm uh, symptoms by rate and rhythm control, and of course, a repeat re-evaluation. And among the comorbidities and cardiovascular risk factors, again, hypertension in the first place the strongest risk for atrial fibrillation and stroke after atrial fibrillation onset. So you need to address blood pressure uh, besides all the other risk factors and lifestyle factors that have been related to atrial fibrillation, in most cases also to heart failure. So it is important to address those risk factors. Should we now go about and tell everybody to screen for themselves for atrial fibrillation? Of course not. I told you it's an age-related disease, and when we search systematically for atrial fibrillation before the age of 60, 65, this is not uh, a much, um, um, this will not provide a high yield. But on the other hand, if atrial fibrillation is detected, and patients and individuals, before they get patients, consumers, use devices and detect atrial fibrillation early, there are opportunities through this earlier detection and then earlier treatment. This will also, the earlier detection and consumer-based um, detection of atrial fibrillation will expand over time the access to integrated health care. It will empower consumers and patients 
and hopefully increase education and cardiovascular awareness because when you screen for something, you are aware of the disease and also of other underlying risk factors and diseases very likely. However, there are also challenges to going and trying to identify atrial fibrillation early. We do not have the pathways currently for treatment and there may be a significant healthcare burden if many more individuals enter the healthcare system um, with early atrial fibrillation or possible atrial fibrillation we will, because we will detect atrial fibrillation earlier in younger individuals with limited risk factors. There will be many false positives and also false negatives and there are a lot of knowledge gaps today that we need uh, to address before we should really go towards screening and very early detection of atrial fibrillation. So the take home messages are clearly there are sex differences in atrial fibrillation onset and effective risk factor management, treatment of underlying cardiovascular comorbidities should be started in both women as well as men and this early detection gives us the opportunity to do so. To date, there is limited data and there are no clear sex or gender difference for the management of early atrial fibrillation. We need to have a careful balance of anticoagulation benefits versus bleeding risk. I showed you the very early the device detected atrial fibrillation populations where the benefit of oral anticoagulation is much less than in clinically detected atrial fibrillation, the data we all know. But we have the opportunity or need to take this chance to slow progression of atrial fibrillation and thus reduce burden of atrial fibrillation. We have the opportunity for early rhythm control, for symptom reduction, and possibly for the reduction of future cardiovascular events. And with that, I would like to conclude, and I'm open for questions.